I have seen a lot of different stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of different inspections. And you can get good data from any of these inspections. You just have to understand the data that you're getting and when it leads you to the next inspection. So my goal here is to help you understand when you need to do an internal inspection, when you can just look at something from the outside, and when you can look at it when it's operating to see something even better. Okay? Through wall leaks aren't usually happening during an outage when I'm there to inspect your tanks. So I can see leak traces maybe, but I won't get to see how it's operating, how it's happening. Most of you don't bring inspectors out for in-plant during operation inspections. So most of this will fall on your inspection groups in your plants. The purpose of every inspection should be to obtain the data necessary to make informed decisions on the operation of your equipment. I think, anyway, the goal of inspections is to help you maximize the safe life of your equipment. Everybody wants it to work 30 years, and for most of you it would, if you take care of it, if you maintain it a little bit and pay attention to it. That's what the inspections are hoping to do. If you get enough inspection data, you get enough inspection points, you can make informed decisions when to make repairs to your equipment and not have to replace it. Some of you enjoy running your equipment to the ground, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can be repaired and refurbished so you don't have to replace it every 10, 12 years. So hopefully the data that you get from these different inspections can lead you to good paths with your equipment. Most equipment can be inspected externally almost any time. The trick is to expect, inspect it when it's actually running, not when it's just there stationary. If it's a transfer pipeline, the trick is to see it when it's actually transferring, not when it's sitting there stationary in the rack. That doesn't really provide you as much information about the in operations of it. Part of any inspection plan is balancing when and External inspection can be done and when it needs to be done something else, when it needs to lead to something else. And I brought a simple, fairly simple thing to show you. This is a piece of a flange. It's a sliver of a flange. I've written OD on the outside. It kind of looks like Googles or glasses. But So this is the OD of the flange when you see it. This would be the flange neck going up. When you first look at this flange, you'll see a little hairline crack on the top of that flange like you would see in a flange hub. If all you ever saw was that little hairline crack, you might think, mm, I need to pay attention to that. That could be a problem. But every now and then, the crack goes deep. Oops, I turned my thing off, naturally. Every now and then, the crack goes way deeper than you think. So I'm going to send this around. You can all look at it. But if you see how deep this crack is, it would cause you significant concern. But you won't know how deep that crack is from your external inspection that you're doing. Okay? So that's why this little crack should lead you to a further inspection of this equipment. And I'll pass it around. Okay. So, again, you get different data from different inspections. Most of you who are in the plants, too, will understand the operation of your equipment. Every time you see something, it's not always a catastrophic failure. If you looked at this tank, you might assume there was big issues with this tank. But in truth, there's not. It's a salt saturator. A lot of what you see here is salt hanging on the wall of that tank. And this is the differentiation in level, probably where the water is or where it's carbon veil inside or something like that. So, everything you see that looks concerning isn't always concerning. You should understand your processes. You should know what's happening in your vessel or in your pipeline. Take that into account when you do the inspections. When your, op your equipment is operating, you'll be able to find the actual leak paths that are coming through, too. Hopefully, you won't find any of those. But that's the only time you're really going to find them is when you're under pressure, when the pipe is being used as a transfer line, when the tank is being filled or something like that. Those are the times when you want to see your tank in operation or your pipeline in operation. Any issues that are being induced from those process fluids. We've talked a little bit about IR, and some of this stuff really only happens when you're in operations, okay? The flange is going to come around now. When it was in operation, that crack was a little bit bigger. You can see it a little clearer than now that it's all relaxed back tight. So, any issues from the temperature, any of that kind of stuff, a lot of that stuff indicates engineering issues, and I harp on this because I love Daryl, but 
Fix the issue, the underlying issue also. Don't just replace the flange, okay? It may be that when they installed that flange, they installed it with a one inch gap and they used the come along to bring it home and then tightened up the bolts. It might not be that you've got a process issue. So pay attention to a lot of different stuff, but when it's running, pay attention to any leaks especially. The only times you'll again really see through wall leaks is when it's in operation. And not just the plant's running, but that equipment is actually running. If you see a through wall leak, you have an oh crap moment. Okay, fiberglass should not leak through. Another issue you're gonna have is, just because the water's coming out here, doesn't mean the leak's there inside. The leak might well be down here at the joint. Travels up underneath the weld, pops out up there. When you put an external patch on a fiberglass tank to fix the leak, it doesn't do it. No matter how good your fabricator is, because all it's gonna do is push that to another leak source. It's just gonna make it follow that path until it finds another weakness and pops out again. The only way to fix an in a leak is internally, painful as that is. When you're doing your external inspections, it's not always just the equipment that you wanna look at. You wanna look around the equipment to see different stuff too. A lot of this stuff, again, is when you're in operation. So hopefully you'd have a chance to see if you're leaking sulfuric acid out of your tank and it's eating your foundation apart. Because eventually that tank's going to fail because it doesn't have a foundation anymore. But sometimes everything's perfect, too. And you want to know that, too, that you don't have leaks. You know, that, hey, we put in this new pipe or this new valve. Looks like it's going great. And I wanted to put this picture in here, too, because... These two penetrations were probably cut by the same guy and the sheet metal guy probably did the same work on both of those penetrations. And I doubt he took a hammer to one side, but not the other. So that pipe's moving. If you see that, just y'all walking through your plants. And one of the things I'm hoping to give you in this presentation is that when you're out in your plants, take the extra step. Look at your equipment. If it's your equipment, pay attention to it because you know what it should do and what it shouldn't do. And if that was my equipment and I saw that, I would know I had an issue <clears throat> that I needed to solve. Might be catastrophic, might not be. But still, pay attention all around you, especially if the equipment is yours, okay? Fiberglass equipment has a lot of flexibility. It does amazing stuff. Daryl showed the picture, I probably have it also in this presentation, of the pipe moving six inches and hitting the handrail and bouncing off still holding water, still doing his job, but I doubt very seriously that any stress analysis he's ever done had six inches of movement allowable at the end of that. So, take what you're seeing and fix the, the root cause, not just patch the problem. If your piping has supports, please put proper supports on it. Sometimes it's painful to see how y'all temporarily support stuff because it becomes permanent. There's an awful lot of ropes hanging pipes, just jute ropes. Hanging pipes and plants. As much money. I mean, they talk about y'all making a half a million dollars a day. Seriously. Fix something, for God's sakes. Before you break it. <clears throat> if you see something like this on your walk down in your plant, that's not right. It's your responsibility as the plant engineer or the plant maintenance guy to fix that. Because this is a big pipe that's, that piece of wood's holding up. Probably wasn't designed that way. Some stuff to check also is like hold down lugs when a tank is in operation. It doesn't take much to just walk by, bump it, see if the dog is engaged or if the dog's not engaged. It's two minutes on your walk from this part of the plant to that part of the plant. Just focus and pay attention on the little things. That's what will save you the big thing. We talk a lot about flanges and that flange I'm sending around now should indicate to you that flanges are a big issue with fiberglass. Piping and tanks too. Most tank manufacturers don't accept a lot of movement of the pipe coming into their tank. So I'm not sure how many of you would take a tank and buy it, but then guarantee that every insert pipe, every inlet, every outlet, everything has zero loads on that tank flange. Unless you're gonna put an expansion joint on every flange, it's not realistic. So you have to understand that there is movement. There is things that are gonna break your flanges. And again, if you see it and it's on a raised face right there, simple. You broke your flange. That's kind of on you at that point. But if you've got a, you know, a lug valve and it should have transferred some loads, they really don't transfer loads that well through those kind of valves, but it should have. But one of the biggest issues you'll see, and it's been talked about a lot, is no spacer rings on raised face 
and it will break the fiberglass flange eventually because it'll have a small leak during an outage and you'll have your guys tighten it up a little bit. It'll be fine and it'll have a small leak and you'll have them tighten it up again next time. And the third time you have it tighten it up, it goes pop. Then you have to replace your flange. So please add spacer rings on anything that's raised face. Save yourselves a lot of trouble. James talked about IR. It does amazing things. It's uh, a coming tool that will be much more used in the future. It can do even more that we're working on now, but this is one of the tools we use in inspections too. You can also do this. I'll tell you that we started with one of those $40 ones you put on your iPhone and walk around with. You're not gonna see the detail you need. This is a good camera. This was expensive, but this is an important part of an inspection and everybody doesn't have an unlimited budget, but if you have money, Consider trying to find something like this. And then again, like every other inspection tool, use it, learn it. And then when you find a big problem, call us and let us help you fix it. Okay? But this is another inspection tool that can be used. We do use it. During normal plant operations, you have the opportunity to observe the common and uncommon stuff that goes on around your plant. Because it's not always just that piece of equipment or that vessel. There might be a steam pipe right next to that fiberglass pipe that's causing heat into the fiberglass pipe. There might be an injection into a tank that you don't really see until you go to inject into that tank and then that pipe vibrates like crazy and breaks the handrails up top. But you wouldn't see that unless you're there when it's happening. I don't think you should follow your process every day, but again, most of you that work in plants, when you're walking through your plant, your equipment, pay attention to it, have knowledge of it and, and learn. When, uh, when your vessel's being loaded, either from a rail car or a truck or however you load it, pay attention then. Those are different actions for your vessel. If it's a storage vessel and it lives 50% of it or 90% of its life stationary, just holding liquid for you, that's perfect. It's not the best time to look at it though. When you're pumping in new chemicals and it's 10% full and you're blasting it full of 180 degree chemicals, that's the time to look at it. So. Pay attention to your inspections and do them at the right time. We talked about high heat or corrosive activity ongoing too. One of the things that, that, that I wouldn't say we learned the hard way because it wasn't us, but we did a metal relining when they went to put the dip tube back in. The dip tube was supposed to face into the tank so that the sulfuric acid went into the liquid at the bottom of the tank. Whoever installed that spun it around 180. They actually shot sulfuric right onto the tank wall. Lasted about three days, and then they called us. So pay attention to little things too, okay? And don't always assume, because the first call we got was pretty nasty after that, after that lining had failed. Don't always assume it's me, sometimes it is. But do your due diligence, do your own inspections, find out what you can first on your own. Ladders and platforms, I might be the only one of us that ever has to climb up these things and go up on top and inspect your tanks for you. I can tell you that these are wicked places for wasp nests too, and they will chase you down. <clears throat> but you often see too, these are uncommon things that aren't usually used. So lifting lugs can show breaks in the laminates. You're probably never gonna use that lifting lug again, hopefully, so it may or may not be a big deal, but that's a laminate fracture in your tank. And the same thing with these ladders. I won't say regularly, but often, one of those clips is delaminated and popped loose. And as you're climbing up that ladder, you start to wonder if I've gained weight or if the ladder's loose somewhere. Okay. I'm usually the one that's noting that for you and putting it in your inspection report. So here's the other side. Please fix them if I do. So what else should you look at when you're looking at the outsides of your tanks? Check your flange bolting. We talk so much about flanges, but please take something from that. It's a big issue. Okay, watch your torques. Make sure your external vents are clear. I was at a job site one time, and they told me a story about before I was there of an external pipe, a vent pipe that had come down, and it had a bucket underneath it to catch whatever was coming out of the vent there. Well, bucket filled with water. And it got cold and it froze. Now it's not a vent because you just solidified that vent with water underneath it. Then they drew a little vacuum and they sucked your tank in. And they couldn't figure out why, because you froze your vent solid. So if you have an overflow vent or something like that, don't put a bucket under it that is above it. Otherwise, you could end up with a vacuum. Check your overflow piping. Make sure it's not capped. That's kind of what I was getting at there too. 
and any mechanical damage from processed fluids. Sometimes there's other stuff that happens in your plants that don't, it's not responsible for FRP. Maybe a pipe broke above it, a level up. Well, everything gets washed down on top of that tank or on top of that pipe. And fiberglass is very corrosion resistant internally, typically. Externally, it's not as corrosion resistant. So if you have some high corrosion chemicals pouring onto the outside of your fiberglass equipment, odds are it's not going to last very long. Pairing an internal and external inspection. This is a good thing to do. This is kind of our preferred method because I'm not typically there during your operation. So for us, what we like to do is be able to understand what's happening outside from what's inside the vessel normally. The best way to inspect a vessel currently internally is visually. We've worked with drones, we've worked, we have bore scopes, we have all that stuff. There is other things too, like I can take UT measurements on the outside of that tank and I can tell you how thick it is. And there's people that can possibly tell you what the value of that is. But the tank shell doesn't normally fail. Your welds fail. Your bottom's gonna come off or something like that. A flange is gonna leak. And that stuff you can't really tell until you're inside looking at it to see if the bottom knuckle's damaged, to see if your internal lamin laminates are getting washed off. So any external damage that you find that was caused by mechanical means, like if somebody bumped it with a forklift or a crane ball or something like that, I know it's rare that happens, but occasionally it does. So anytime you see external damage like that, you need to look inside and see if you have corresponding internal damage. Because almost every time you've done something significant enough to hurt the outside of the tank, you have damaged your corrosion barrier. The corrosion barrier is much higher in resin content, 90 plus percent. That makes it very brittle too, that surface. So if you puncture from the outside or even push it, it has a tendency to fracture that very brittle surface. That surface is what's holding back chemicals. So if it's fractured, you have a problem. So if you see something significant on the outside, pair it with an internal inspection, okay? We talked about fiber bloom before, UV damage. That's what this is. This tank is ugly, but it's still very effective. She's beautiful to me because she's still holding liquids, probably 35 years in service. But the fiber bloom is significant. I respect that. I understand that. Some of y'all need pretty plants, and you can paint that any color you want, and it'll be fine. Okay? But otherwise, that's not main structural damage. You want to monitor that, and if you start seeing it, you know, is other issues parallel with that, then I would extend my inspections. But if I just saw that walking through a plant, I'd be proud of it. I wouldn't be scared of it. An internal inspection of your FRP equipment will provide you the detailed information of the wetted surfaces. That's where your chemicals really meet the road. <clears throat> Inside is where everything is at. The, the outside of your vessel is just there to structurally hold the inside together, basically. So your internal corrosion barrier is critical to the holding of your, equip, to, uh, the holding of your fluid, whether it's in the pipe or a tank or a scrubber or whatever. If your internal corrosion barrier is damaged, you have issues, and you need to start paying attention to that equipment more carefully. Increase your internal inspections, figure out if you're gonna to need to do a repair, something like that. For me, I'm confident that through good inspections, I can make your equipment last longer and be safer on your sites. I realize there's a cost with that. But if you have the ability to extend the life of your equipment, and make it safer just simply by doing typical inspections, it's not that much, okay? I'm trying not to sell inspections, but you can do your own inspections and get them too. For FRP, corrosion barrier is 90% resin, and the resin is what's corrosion resistant. So that's where everything's most important. When we see damages to the corrosion barriers, there's a lot of different damage mechanisms that you might see. Corrosion from chemicals or something like that. You might start seeing glass where the resin has been eaten away and the only thing remaining is glass. Hopefully you don't see that. But two, I think Daryl talked about this. You see the zigzags up and down. If you see straight lines like that or something that's continuous like that, you've done something. It's either your process or you hydroblasted your tank so that I could inspect it 
and you ate through your tank wall. Hydro blasting has made me as much money as almost anything else out there. <clears throat> Be careful. I understand and I respect and I request you clean your equipment because if it's trashed inside, all I'm going to tell you is how dirty it is. But when you clean your equipment, clean it right. Don't shoot a hydro blaster down through it and eat out half of the corrosion barrier laminate. Because I'll tell you that too, but you won't be happy either, because then you have to fix that tank before it goes back in service. Besides the corrosion that you'll see, sometimes your processes aren't exactly what you expected. Sometimes laminates get overheated, or there's an impingement of air, and the liquid that they thought was going to cool it doesn't actually cool it. And so, when you, if you don't do an internal inspection, you're never going to know that these laminates are having issues until it's a structural issue. And once it's a structural issue, then it's a significant thing. Some of this damage you can fix. Once it becomes structural, it's very difficult to fix it though. So any unexpected flows of process fluids. And some of this, I understand process engineers are brilliant people. I've met a few of them. Um, but they don't always know how things are going to operate in the real world. That's a kind way of putting it. Um, so sometimes the flow doesn't go where they think. Sometimes things don't happen the way they think. And if you just trust it and never do an inspection, you're going to find out the hard way that sometimes they make mistakes too. Some com corrosion barrier laminate damage you'll see, you can explain away pretty simply. You know, if I walk into a tank and I see axial cracking, my first indication is that you've done something thermally to that tank. That's a typical indication of that. Is it catastrophic? Probably not immediately. It's dangerous. Uh, you want to monitor it carefully because I'll tell you too, they look small there, but when the tank expands, they get bigger. So anything that is in that tank is going through those cracks. Usually those cracks don't go all the way through the corrosion barrier, but you have no way of knowing that. Much like that flange I'm passing around. You have no way of knowing how deep that stuff goes until you see it. Some mechanical damages happen in your tanks a lot of times from agitators and other motions. If you have an agitated tank, you really, really need to do an internal inspection, at least periodically. What periodically is to you, I can't define. I would say at least every three years, almost everything should at least be looked at internally. Because again, most of what you're doing is corrosive or something dirty. If it's an emergency water tank and you inspect it every 10 years, okay, I get that. But anything that's a process tank that is actively seeing fluids come and go, you need to inspect regularly. God bless you. So when you have agitators, you'll see mechanical damages on the walls from, from erosion. Sometimes too, you'll see where it's actually eating a hole in the tank and that's concrete. I'll be honest, when I came out of that tank, the maintenance manager asked me how long he could run it before he had to make the repairs. I said, do you mean repairs to the concrete or the fiberglass? Because you're already through the tank. So, I get that y'all need to get back in <laughs> service, but uh, if you have holes in your tank, you've got to fix them. That's kind of my thing. And then sometimes you'll repurpose a tank. What you see here is some place where they used to have a trough, where this emptied into a trough. Well, for some reason, they decided to take the trough off, but they kind of did it the hard way. I mean, sledgehammers are not the way to remove things from fiberglass. And if you did, you should have come back and put laminates over the structural laminates right there to cover them because that's going to be an issue sooner or later. Flex knuckles, you can, as often as you can find damages in a flange, you can find damages in a flex knuckle of a tank. It's a difficult transition area. Daryl has explained it to me many, many times about how forces have to react and be transferred through. And it's a beautiful thing when it's done right, but it's rarely ever done right. So when you're doing your internal inspections, Pay attention to the bottom knuckles on your tanks. If you don't see damage there, good. You got a good tank. If you do, consider it's not just a laminate issue. You probably have some sort of a tank issue too because there's a lot of flex in there and you need to overcome that flex and just putting more laminates on top of it is not going to give you more flex. It's your chance too when you do the internal inspection to see how all of the operations of the equipment is working inside. You know, are all of your internal beams still hanging right? Has your piping pushed it down a little bit? Are your stilling wells at the right level? Are they doing the right things? And one thing I want to remind you of, on most of your scrubbers, you have me inspect this part for you and I'll stick my head in the top manways. 
but there's 20 feet of packing above that right there, and nobody's ever taken that packing out for me to see that shell. So there's stuff that happens in there, and most of you don't want to pack and un or unpack and repack your vessels. I understand the cost effect. Uh, but there's stuff that happens in there that none of us knows about, unless you try a borescope or something, but then you don't get a lot of depth of perception on that borescope through a flange hole. So especially if you're going to repack a, a scrubber or something like that, that's a perfect time to do a full inspection on it because you don't do those repackings very often. So what I want to leave you with with that is, again, if you have an opportunity that you know you're going to do that, consider adding that to your schedule, okay, because it, it won't happen very often. Flanges and nozzles on the inside are just as critical as on the outside because the flanges and nozzles in your vessels especially are what's bringing the fluids in or taking the fluids out. So they see a lot of activity. We talked about corrosion before. You can see there's glass kind of on the surface of this. It's more along the lines of corrosion where something's eating the resin out of that flange. So, and that's more like a mechanical damage after some of that cracking has initially happened. Either a lot of flow or something hit that, probably. One of the things I've learned in doing internal vessel inspections is your dip, anything that's going to have an internal projection typically is an inlet flange, hopefully. Not always, though, so you have to check them all. But you want to look inside your flanges, too, because it might be eating the flange up from the inside out. And just looking from the outside of that, from here, it looks like a perfect uh, inlet. No problem. In the grand scheme of things, if this did eventually flake away and, and you had some issues, probably wouldn't be catastrophic. But if you don't pay attention to that, it could eventually be because it'll go further and further up. The piping coming into that is a special dual laminate, high intensity pipe. That's one of the things that made me think, if they need something that specialized to bring this chemical into the tank, why is it not in a dip tube? Why is it just coming through the fiberglass into the tank? Sure enough. It was not good for the fiberglass nozzle. Blisters. I don't know that you'll all ever see blisters in fiberglass, but it's not uncommon. There's a lot of blisters in fiberglass equipment. It's not always bad. It's not good, but it's not always bad either. It's not an immediate catastrophic fix it now. If your blisters are growing and if they're starting to grow into each other and they're starting to expand, then you have a big issue. If you're going in this vessel for the first time in 20 years, though, and you see some blisters. You don't have any experience to know if they're brand new, if they just happened from a process change you made, or if they've been slowly happening all along. So track them. Mark them out. Come back the next year. Most times a grease pencil or something like that, I don't know how, makes it through your processes. And you can come back the next year and they'll see my initials on your tanks, of, on your walls of your tanks. So do that and then come back and see if they're growing, if they're expanding. If they are, then research it further and find out why. Blisters happen for a lot of different reasons. There's no exact cause of them. A lot of times it's a portion of the chemical slowly sucking through, and then as it cools back down during an outage or something like that, it expands back out and pops it loose. Slowly but surely, the edges get bigger and bigger. But that's not the only reason. So when you see blisters, monitor them, take care of them, unless they're open or broken. Now, if you have leakage coming out of them, you want to fix those because that's obviously service fluids getting behind the corrosion barrier. Benefits of internal inspections, including a bore scope. I love our bore scope. It's HD. It does neat things. At this point in my life, you can put me through a 24-inch pipe in a Tyvek suit, and I'm a human cleaning pig for you. But much less than 24, and we're going to need a bore scope, y'all. So the goal of using a bore scope is to get the gross data that you can, you know, to see. Is the internal surfaces of your pipe damaged? Can you see the structural wall? Then you know you have a problem. And if you have mud cracking, that's also an issue, but it's not quite as bad as seeing structural laminates that have been removed. It doesn't take much to put a bore scope in a pipe. I think the head of our bore scope needs a two inch flange. Now, you can't always do it in 10 foot diameter pipe because the bore scope wants a snake up in pipe and stuff like that too. So every tool has its uses. Maybe you can just come in through a couple of flanges and at least get yourself some knowledge of what's going on in the tank. But what your goal should be is to find out information on your equipment using any means you can. And then if that information that you gain concerns you, take next steps. 
the damages we talked about from previous repairs. The surprises are what you'll always be surprised by, but, but you'll be happy you found when you do an internal inspection. Because again, you don't know whether that pocket was fixed right or whether they just ripped it off the wall and left it because you were in an outage and you were rushing. Okay? You won't know that something happened here to break that. To actually impact it from the outside probably and pop that loose. Okay? Anytime you see damages, they hopefully are unexpected. Um, but until you go in and see that, that equipment or bore scope or piping, you won't know. If you have time and you can do a destructive test, that's perfect. Um, we love to take samples. We have customers that are real good about that, taking a spool out. And when you put a new spool in, send us the old spool. Daryl and his guys can cut it up in little pieces and tell you all about it. I've seen it done. And there's a lot of useful information that can come of that. You know, how much penetration you've got where your glass is all eaten away in your laminate. How deep the penetration is of the chemicals and other important stuff from the internal parts of your pipe. You can really only do that from destructive testing. So, and if you have a tank that you're concerned about, I believe a 14 inch diameter section of tank, if you want to install a 14 inch diameter flange and a blind flange in your tank, with that piece of laminate, we can test it and tell you the, the stru current structural values of your tank. Dale, yeah. am I wrong? Okay. <laughs> Manway covers do well, but Manway covers are typically contact molded laminates and they're not filament wound laminates that react like the others. But they are very good. Anytime you pull off your Manway covers, you should have them cleaned and at least looked at, okay? That's a perfect place for a bark all tester, though, if you don't want to go inside your tank and you want to test the hardness of the laminates that's remaining inside. When you open up your Manway, test the blind. That's all service. Same service as everything else. So. You can, yep, absolutely. You can do it from honestly any blind. So if you have a four inch flange is typically blinded off on your, on your tank, you can do permeation testing with a smaller sample, right? So there's value in destructive testing too. I don't like to see fiberglass broke, but that's me. So again, the goal is that you understand that there's value in all of your inspections. Um, and then how to take that data from that inspection and make it valuable to you and make it more valuable to you for your next inspections.